Hello, Sal. Thank you very much for coming on. That's no problem, Chris. Good to be here. Uh, good. For anybody that doesn't know, Sal actually is my reflexologist and she is the owner of Natural Health NI. Um, so, Sal, why don't you just tell us a, a bit about yourself, a bit about your background? Just take the floor for a few minutes and yeah. let's go for it. So, yeah, Natural Health NI um, does what it says in the tin. I, I work in natural health care. I'm a practitioner, a complementary therapist, alternative practitioner. There's lots of different terms that you can use, holistic therapist. Um, yep. Essentially, I am a naturopath, so I deal with looking as much to, to nature as a healer as anything else. That's not to say that I am against um, modern medicine or um, pharmaceutical medication for the purposes of you know people's health. It's just that I I, I apply a, just a different approach, or um, I work synergistically a lot of the time with people and um, say an IVF who are going through a very specific protocol. So it's a synergistic yeah. practice. It's it's naturopathic in the sense that you're taking what you can from the earth that was provided to us yeah. to use for us. Okay. So I just want to ask you a question about the. This is just like a, a myth buster, hopefully. Um, you're saying, obviously, you, like alternative therapists, you try not to use modern medicine, things like that. Um, do you, in, your, in your experience or your opinion, is modern medicine used to treat like a, like a symptom instead of an act, the actual root of the problem? A lot of the time it's seen as, um, you know, you're treating the symptom and not the cause. You know, it's a sticky plaster approach to healthcare. However, I uh, don't want to undermine the potential that medication has because essentially it saves lives many, many times. People um, who are going through uh, operations and so on, they need medication yeah, yeah. specifically. Um, you know, uh, if you, for example, got your kidney removed and you are on anti-rejection medication for the rest of your life because you've only got one kidney and maybe the kidney of a donor, obviously medication is needed and um, yes. so there are certain things like that that absolutely 100 percent but pop and painkillers every two minutes for the odd ache and pain and you know, i've got a headache i'll take painkillers or whatever that approach you know is something that i i like to sort of get to the, the depths of someone says to me an awful terrible heartburn and um, you know obviously people would take a lot of the medications that are out there that are specifically antacid based uh, yep. I would to get address address the cause of why they are having the problem because it's not always down to oh I had a really rich dinner that night I know why or I'm really late stage pregnancy I know why it's just someone could just be like you fit healthy and get extremely bad heartburn but they don't know why do you take antacid medication or do you look for an alternative route and the interesting thing that you're saying about um, alternative therapy one thing I'd like to say is that. Modern medicine has been, it's a, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. It's been around for two to 300 years, essentially, when it comes to pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah. Uh, the therapies in which I provide are centuries old. Yeah. So essentially, you could uh, argue uh, that we're not the alternative, they are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. I can't agree. And I'm, I'm a big fan of alternative therapies. There's, well, what we are calling alternative therapies for the, the, the purposes of this podcast. Yeah, I am a huge fan of it. You know, I don't like taking painkillers. I don't like taking medication unless, unless, of course, like you say, it's for something that's really serious. But, you know, having antidepressants for things that can be treated within people and people aren't looking at their lifestyles, they're just looking for a quick fix and a quick hack to feel better. Um, you know, you have daily exercise. There's so many things that are with daily exercise, good nutrition, mm -hmm. um, things that are within your control. That you can do, you know, Absolutely. Like, you see, there's, there's, there's many facets to that, though. You know, you could be clinically depressed, which means that medication would be suitable for a particular amount of time due to that person's condition. Or you could be bipolar, which means medication is necessary for that particular schizophrenia, so on and so on. But if you feel a bit, a bit down yeah. or a bit flat, which I'm sure at the moment under the current circumstances of COVID-19, there are many, many people out there who could agree with that, resonate with that and identify with that notion. Yeah. I agreed as well with it. obviously there's, there's medical circumstances i'm just you know your everyday person who is just feeling down and they think yeah. they need a pill to, to yeah. solve the problem and it's usually just a, a lifestyle choice just in, in my own experience or it could be a deficiency in nutrients mm -hmm. so what's the what's the biggest challenge you see within your clients in terms of for, for nutrition 
Um, that digestion is pretty much the number one fundamental um, source of a lot of people's problems. Mm -hmm. And if their digestion was better, a lot of their other issues would resolve naturally. Right. Um, 70 to 80 percent of your immune system is in your uh, digestive tract yeah. so because of that you may know that but you know for the purposes of people who are listening i'll explain that um the immune system is a separate system from the digestive system but it resides within the system of the digestion so right. um if your digestive system isn't um optimum or at least anywhere near optimum then you could be immune compromised or if you're immune compromised, you could be affected by poor digestion. So if your body isn't uptaking the nutrients that is necessary due to uh, compromised immune function, leaky gut syndrome, um, absorption issues, then that will contribute to a poor digestion, which then in turn can create a poor immunity, which then in turn can mean that you're more vulnerable, open and susceptible to colds, flus, bugs, and autoimmune conditions. Yeah. I mean, I, I read this article. I don't know if you're going to post this myth again for me. But I read an article a couple of years back, you know, Death Begins in the Colon, and um, talks about acidic food and, and alkaline food and, and things like that. Basically, what it's, what the whole sort of thing was, you know, if you constantly eat acidic food, you know, you get a, a buildup of acidic ash in your colon, which then stops your lymphatic system from draining properly. Is that sort of tied to what you were saying there? Um, to an extent, uh, obviously, um, we need acid in the stomach. Um, usually, um, in the stomach, the, there's a particular acid called hydrochloric acid, which is released when we eat. So there's amylase in the mouth, which is when you salivate. Then it connects to certain pathway enzymes in the digestive tract, like pepsin, um, uh, uh, lipase, and protease. And they then, uh, in turn, with hydrochloric acid, break down proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Yeah. We need hydrochloric acid uh, to break foods down, but also hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Uh, we'll get to the colon in a minute, but the, the stomach itself is, um, it's important to have acid because it's what helps us. Uh, when I say acid, I don't mean bile and, and acid reflux. I mean acid as in uh, hydrochloric acid that the body produces naturally to break down proteins. Um, it's really fundamental to our the beginning of our digestion because if we don't have enough and sufficient amount of that, um, you're open to uh, be more susceptible to infection mm -hmm. through bacterial infection and viral uh, infection. So and parasitic and um, fungal. So with all of those things, you need a certain uh, sufficient amount of hydrochloric acid in order to be able to break down those things properly and also to protect the system from infection. Right. So if you kind of get it started well, the tract, it's as if like, you know, if you start a journey wrong, you'll likely end up in the wrong place or late or diverted or whatever. So that's what diverted and thinking about leaky gut, you know, where it's not permanent, it just it's going through the, the system and not maybe being as effective with regards to digestion and so on. So different things happen in different organs. The lymphatic system is slightly different, you know, um, the lymphatic system is what helps release toxins into the bloodstream to then be carried out through the different different eliminatory organs, one being the colon, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, but obviously there's your skin, which is the biggest organ. So when you sweat, you, you, you release toxins from the lymph and then also through uh, the bladder and then, well, kidney, bladder, renal tract, and also lungs. Okay. So the lymphatic system works on, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a systemic multi-organ um, purpose. Okay, brilliant. Um, I just uh, I just remember reading that a couple of years ago, and I was just wondering how, how true it was, you know, because for a while there I was really getting into you know acid and alkaline foods and how beneficial were they? Um, mm -hmm. obviously alkaline water I know is huge out in America at the minute. I've just seen it over the last year start to pop up here. Can you tell us about the health benefits of that, or is that is it just one big market ploy? Um, combination. So with alkaline, um, obviously they say that uh, a lot of leading experts in research will lead towards the notion that cancer, for example, can't thrive in an uh, alkaline environment. Yeah, is that and, No, it's actually, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, truth to that. Um, okay. So uh, what you're really wanting is, you're not wanting, 
the, the problems that can come with having too much acid can also show itself if you have too much alkaline. Okay. That's why the benefit of having a neutrality of roughly 6.5 to 7.5, i.e. they're looking at 7 as neutral yeah. with the pH. Yeah. Um, because to overdo something, as, yeah. a, as, a nation, as a nation, we would never be alkaline uh, naturally. Yeah. Okay, because you know the foods in which we eat don't lend themselves to being alkaline heavy. Yeah. So we would always just have more acid in the system anyway. So for example, I drink coconut or I drink um, cucumber water. Nearly all my water is cucumber water, mm -hmm. and that means that you don't have to put drops in. You don't have to alkalize the water. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. You just put cucumber in your water, and it becomes alkaline. Really. So, for example, fancy machines at all using a cucumber. That's where the gimmick comes in. Right. Do you know, it's not that there's not truth in the fundamental basis of what you're saying. It's just how it's become used and modified in order to make money mm -hmm. is is the issue. So, for example, I get my water from a spring. It gets delivered to my home, and when I dipstick it um, with a dipstick in order to check with the litmus paper to check its neutrality, it's always seven. Right. If I go to the tap and I pour a glass of water and I do the litmus test, it's about 5.5. .5. Okay. So our water in the tap is acidic in nature, but how we drink it, it won't appear acidic. Yeah. We don't taste acid, we don't taste yeah, it. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's like eating an orange, you know, it's acidic. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you drink water, you don't know, but I do because I'm so water orientated with regards to making sure that it's our source of life. We have to get a good source of life. So I won't drink tap water. Um, if I'm out in a restaurant and I happen to have a glass of water or something, something like that, but even the ice in my freezer is from a spring. Right. Okay. So what, what, what can people do? on an everyday basis that sort of help them drink better water? Um, well, you know, there's, there's a great company, um, Ardmore Water. Um, they're great. They're down in Newry uh, yeah. and they provide spring water. Um, and you know, it comes with a certificate of analysis in order to determine, you know, exactly where the water's come from um, the properties in the water at the time of the water being sourced and so on. Um, so that's important. But you see, there's no, there's no chlorine, there's no fluoride, there's no metals, there's no recycled hormones. You know, it literally is before it gets to the reservoir stage of yeah. um, being filtrated through our, our, our water system to get to our taps, essentially. And you can understand why these things are put in because the treatment that needs to happen in order to make sure that you're not going to end up with E. coli poisoning by the time the water gets to you, yeah. you know, the yeah. justification yeah. and why they do what they do. But doesn't mean that it's the only option open to us. Now, if someone right. said to me, okay, well, would you drink tap water or would you drink bottled water? I would drink tap water. Really? It's neck and neck. And yeah. it's not that I actually then think the tap water is great for you. It's just, it's the better, lesser of two evils. Right. So the, the, why the bottled water then? Because that's bottled water, well, it's BPA chemical, isn't it? Anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's, it's an endocrine disturber, uh, disruptor. So because the endocrine system is a set of glands producing the body's own natural hormones, um, to have something where you drink out of every day that is uh, contaminated to the point that it's leaching into the water from the plastic, uh, it's essentially uh, excess um, uh, man-made estrogen. So... Yes. You know, and you don't want, the, well, I mean, there's that kind of man boob epidemic, isn't there? Where all these men are drinking water at the gym and they think that this is great. But what they don't realize is, is that they're actually drinking synthetic estrogen, which is a predominantly female hormone, yeah. um, which yeah. is not great for uh, any, not even aesthetics, just your internal endocrine yeah. homeostasis uh, is yeah. completely disrupted by drinking out of plastic. Yeah. I'm Club and Peter to pay Paul, you know. Yeah, well, we, we had this conversation a while back, the last time we seen each other, this exact reason, and I bought, obviously, one of these. Good man. Look, it could be placebo effect or whatever, but I definitely feel better when I drink out of that rather than drink from, because I just used to get a plastic bottle and just refill it from the tap. So you're kind of getting the, the worst of both worlds there. I know. 
So and I the don't... money you spend, the money you actually spend, mm -hmm. I mean, the water I get, it's way, way cheaper. Um, yes, you do pay, and yes, the tap is free, and you could argue that you know people can't afford it, this, that, and the other, but if you can't, then alkalize it by adding cucumber. It does yeah. something. It's better than doing nothing. So I can just throw, so I fill that up from the tap, yeah, and then I yeah. can just throw a bit of cucumber in, and it's going to alkalize yeah. it a bit. Well, not to leave it. Yeah, I mean, you could no. leave it there. I, I keep it in the fridge in a jug, and then it means that the water is cucumber water, which is more sort of... Um, it's steeped in there. Okay. And then, you know, in the morning when I refill it, it's just, I, I refill my bottle like yours and it's so, it's almost like creamy. Yeah. It's so yum. Um, but if you actually then dip it, you'll see that the pH changes because you've added the cucumber. Okay. And people need certification. Brilliant. Or proof, you know. Okay. That's, that, that's really interesting. I never knew that cucumber would just, just drop it a bit because I always wonder why people done it. Um, but how does that work whenever they have, because you see, obviously see lemon, lime and cucumber in water. So what, what's the purpose of having They're that? all alkaline. Is le are lemon and limes alkaline too? Mm -hmm. lime they lime. look, um, in their natural form, they're acidic, but they're metabolized in alkaline form. Right, okay. There you go, another one we didn't know about. Myth busted all over the show. <laughs> um, so just talk about, let's talk about your, your, your coaching practice. Um, what are the, what, you know, you have people in for different treatments. What's the most common treatment that you, that you do with people? Um, it would probably be mostly hormone work. Um, so people who've got hormone uh, imbalances. So anything from menstruation to menopause. Right. Yeah. So there's a common thread there. And the problem that women have is men, you know. <laughs> no, it's whenever we were training. Um, yeah, that guy's we, yeah. straight I'm not a feminist. Comes straight to the source here. Not a feminist, just just to make that very clear out there. But like the cup, we all got a cup, and on the cup it said, um, um, all women's problems start with men, and it was menopause, menstruation, mental, <laughs> all the names. And then when you drank in the inside of the cup, it says, and all women's problems uh, all have men in the middle of them, dysmenorrhea, amenorrhea, and so on. It was just a bit of a laugh. And there was one guy in the class, and, you know, God help him. <laughs> I'm sure he got some serious abuse. He did, and um, that kind of tells you that, that that is the most work I do. I mean... I do treat men as well, um, fertility. So it's, it's female, male fertility, a lot of assisted IVF work in preparation for treatment, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of natural uh, non-assisted IVF with regards to just fertility generally, um, pregnancy, prenatal, postnatal, uh, maternity. Um, so anything from menstruation to menopause, PMS, perimenopausal, menopausal, and so on. So that would be about 60 to 70% of my work Totally. Yeah. And then the other 30% would be the likes of yourself, general well-being, general health care, um, and then people with digestive issues, um, anxiety, massive, massive. And even the people who are coming for the fertility, a lot of their underlying problems are actually central, central nervous system um, yeah. based. So stress, anxiety, tension, irritability, low mood, sleep disturbances, headaches, panic attacks, yeah. All those sorts of things. And they're, I mean, I would say that to people. I almost have it like, it's like a little rhyme in my head. You know, I just say, well, do you ever suffer from stress, anxiety, tension? And I, I, I'm yet, you know, yet to have somebody who says, I've never experienced anything like that ever in my life ever before. I mean, everyone, I think it's natural that we stress because that's why we have cortisol. That's why we have adrenaline. You know, that's why we have certain hormones that are there to deal with stress they wouldn't be there if there weren't any stresses to be dealing with mm -hmm. you know and it's even something as simple as like being in a traffic jam you release excess cortisol mm -hmm. you are trying to find your keys in a rush you release excess cortisol so well, even though you may not think you're stressed about a particular issue there's stresses that happen throughout the day that will bring that and our modern life and our modern world up until very recently even though it's new stresses was filled full of juggling contact balls all the time. Juggle, juggle, juggle. Another ball comes in, another ball comes in. And we're constantly having to deal with like a thousand million things all the time. Yeah. And even if you're the best of managers and you're the best you know, circus ring leader, you're still having to deal with stress regardless of how you deal with that stress. Yeah. Matt, 
honestly, there, there's you need, really need to have stress management things in place, especially today with everything so fast paced. Um, like for myself, I'm quite high energy. I like to go at a really fast pace. That's just how I am. But I also have stress management um, techniques in place as well that I use. Mm. And you, I used to see myself getting worked up over the smallest things. It's like, you know, you thought you were going to be late somewhere. And all of a sudden, it's like you feel the tension in your shoulders. And it's just like, I don't want and you kind of get yourself worked up into it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. over the last couple of years, especially, I've really worked that down. And it's, it's probably been the best thing. People just don't take the time every single day to, to do small things to manage their stress. But That's what, right. What, what can they do? What can they do? Let's say they have 10 to 15 minutes a day. What, what can they do? As much as this is going to sound idealistic, it's actually the simplest thing you can actually do is to meditate. And... I know that a lot of people will hear this and go, oh, I haven't time to meditate and I can't meditate. I've tried to meditate and it just doesn't work. My head's full of stuff. So is everybody. But yet some people just try and try and try and try and try again. Because there's days I do my meditation practice and I'm properly at one zen to the max. And then there's other days I am away off somewhere thinking about a thousand things I need to do when I finish this. Yeah, it doesn't make me a bad I call person. It practice though, because you need to practice it on a regular basis. As in, it is the point. A couple of days. It's not. It's not like you don't do it for a week. I know when I first started, the first few weeks were atrocious. They were just so difficult to yeah. get into the routine. But see now, it's it's a kind of one of my favorite parts of the day where I just for ten or fifteen minutes, yeah. and just breathe deeply. But and, people don't realize the the benefit that doing something like that for even such a short space of time sets how it sets that you up for the day. Yeah. But, they, but it's like a knock on effect because they get stressed at the fact that they can't meditate. They get stressed about that and then they get stressed about what they have to do with the finish. It's like, mm-hmm. and then they just, oh, it's not for me. Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. There's a big course you can do in Queens with a guy called Frank Liddy. He's great. Uh, he, he taught me, my mum, uh, mindfulness meditation and, you know, mindfulness, I suppose, is a, it's kind of a coffee table psychology term to basically say, meditate. Yeah. Mindful in your meditation practice. You know, Jean Kabat-Zinn was, was a great um, pioneer in that modality, but meditation is just centering your thoughts and allowing yourself to not be so um, hard on yourself if you do think, because you know we're programmed we're wired to think all the time even when we're sleeping we dream so it's not about forcing the thoughts out Mm -hmm. it's about you know i'm sure you know this yourself it's it's if the thought comes in just let it out don't focus on the fact that it's there or you're trying to push it out yeah you just literally let it go with the out breath and then you bring yourself back to the centering intention for the day um that's the way i do it and yes that 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 15 minute now since the whole kind of lockdown situation i feel like i am getting more routine with my meditation practice under the basis of constraint you know we're here we can't go anywhere we're trying to do our best and you know one of the management uh coping mechanisms or strategies that i've implemented is meditation and making sure that it's part of my routine. Now, I just hope that if and when we get back to some form of normality, that I'm able to have that continuity of practice because I absolutely love it. But it's like anything, you know this, people will say this to you all the time. Oh, I, I, when I hadn't exercised for ages and then I did it, I couldn't believe why I didn't do it all the time. You know, it's this kind of human behavior that we're all programmed. We all know what's good for us. It's about how we ascertain the goodness and how we sustain that goodness. The, the, way, the way I've been doing it the last few weeks is accountability. Oh, sorry. Um, the way I've, just accountability, you know, we, we were due to go up and do some sprints just up in the football field, something really simple. And I was dreading it. I just didn't want to do it. So I texted my friend, I was like, do you want to go do some runs? And he said, yeah. And then I had no, I had nowhere to go then. So it's just being accountable to someone else to, to keep your, your lifestyle in check is, is mm-hmm. crucial. 
Um, mm-hmm. You do that through for for medication. Maybe you could do it through is it is it our apps? You know, Headspace. Oh, there's a great one at the minute. There's an absolutely amazing one. It's um Deepak Chopra and Oprah Winfrey, and it's called the Twenty One Day um, Meditation, and it's all geared around the concept of hope. Right. Okay. So because it's Oprah and Chopra, I've decided to call it the Oprah Hooper Chopra. <laughs> and it's literally like 21 days of, of Hooper with Oprah and Chopra. So um, it's fantastic. I'm on day seven and uh, oh, it's just, it's, it's special now. It really is because he gives you a centering mantra. There's a focus. It's 20 minutes. It's not too short. It's not too long. And it gives you that guided um basis of meditation where people who are starting out who are a bit like uncertain or ambiguous or lost with regards to how to do it and have no structure or they don't really know how to do it. It's a really good start because it really gives you a, a structure and a program to work with to the point where you'd hope that in time you wouldn't necessarily need an app. Yeah. I remember the first time that I actually meditated, just as you said that. Um, I haven't done any real guided meditation in quite quite a while. I just sort of do it in silence. It seems to work better for me. Yeah. But I remember the first time I tried it, it was my, a guy I know sent me through a couple of different guided meditations. I was like, right, I'll give this a go. But I had no earphones at the time, so I had to, I had to play it on the laptop when I sat there on the edge of the bed. Obviously, he didn't really know what I was doing. Um, so I, I pressed play, uh, and then I sat down. And I thought, you know, maybe it's a few, couple, few seconds before it starts. And I was sitting there. And I was just breathing deeply, breathing deeply, breathing deeply. I was like, maybe, maybe there is nothing here. And I was sitting there, it must have been for a good 45, 50 minutes, even close to an hour. And then I, I, I got up and switched it on, realized that I actually hadn't hit play, I'd hit something else. So, <laughs> sitting there in complete silence um, for, for almost an hour with no meditation, uh, no guided meditation. Brilliant, brilliant. So, um, yeah, if you want to do one, try a guided one first. Let me show you switch it on. My, my top. <laughs> yeah. Did you find benefit in it? I, I, I don't know because I kept thinking at the time. It was my first time ever meditating. And I kept thinking, should I be hearing something? Should I still be here? How, how do I know when it's finished? That's, that, that was the biggest question I kept asking myself. So oh my it was pro- probably was nice to switch off for an hour though. Yeah, well. So what, how, how has the lockdown sort of changed how you're doing business now? Um, well, it's given me time to focus on writing my cookbook. Yeah. Because it's been something that, it's like a, sometimes feel like a stuck record when I think of uh, how long I've been trying to write it. But then I suppose, you know, I've, I've published, I've made an album, I've written an album, musician, don't play as much anymore, more for fun and pleasure now. Um, the biggest gigs I did were supporting Jules Holland on his um, UK and Irish tour. I did the right. opening for, I don't know if I told you that before. Yeah, well, before. No. So, full of surprises me. Um, so, I, I did um, the support for the Board Gosh in Dublin and the INEC Arena in Killarney. So, I did three, three dates of about 12,000 people I played in front of in three days collectively. Um, and I opened for Jules Holland and his Rhythm and Blues Orchestra. Yeah. No pressure, no pressure at all. Um, and and I, I did, I really enjoyed it. That was a couple of years ago because I've, I've written an album and then I wanted to publish it and produce it and so on. So I did all that and um, some really, really good people on it. Um, a guy called um, Michael um, Sands and he was a guitar player and he was amazing. Um, and a lot of people had organ on piano and I had Ernie McMillan, a renowned guitar luthier um, on bass and I had uh, Sean Randall on drums. Now I'm going to have to mention them all because I can't leave somebody out. Sean Randall on drums. Was great drums jazz. Um, job, oh yeah, Sean Randall on drums. He was a great, he's a, he's a great jazz a percussionist. Um, and then I had a guy called Rohan Young. He, um, he was a boron player, and then I had a guy called um, Mario Cafallo, who was a fiddle player. And then I had um, uh, Limney Hamilton, uh, BBC broadcaster uh, on uh, trumpet. And then I had um, a guy called, well, he wasn't on the album, he was on the, um, on the, the gigs. Um, but a guy I had on the album was a guy called Aaron Liddard, and he was um, 
the, a really amazing saxophonist from London and he played in Amy Winehouse's band um, on the Back to Back tour and on the Rehab song and all right. that. And he also played with Prince and Beverly Knight and some really, really amazing people. So he played sax on the album as well. The album's called... Yeah, sorry. Nost oh yeah, oh yeah. Nostalgia Queen is the album. So basically, um, what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is, is that I know I can produce material, but I've been in, in this kind of stuck record of, I want to write my cookbook, I want to write my cookbook, but I know that I have the potential of actually doing something and creating product because I made my album. Yeah. But... I feel now I, the, the real thing I really want to concentrate on is, is the cookbook. And I never get the opportunity and the chance to really actually do it yeah. because I'm always so busy or I'll say, to people, oh, I just wish I had more time to do that. And I mean, I, I, literally weeks before the lockdown, no joke, Chris, I haven't even actually told anybody this yet. So you're the first to know and many now will follow. Stay tuned, stay tuned, everybody. <laughs> I actually said about two or three weeks before all this happened, um, God, if only I just had a month off. Like, just I need I need to have some time to just regroup with all the things that I want to do and all yeah. the ideas that I want to implement and all the you know, everything. And there's no one would actually want this to happen what's happening right now but i'm just trying as you asked me how am i coping in the lockdown i am just really really grateful that um trying to find gratitude in the things that we have and the things that we um you know can be grateful for and just yeah. work with what the framework with what we have rather yeah. than be worried about what we don't have and um, in that framework that I'm in, in feeling at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm writing away at my cookbook, the one thing that I've been wanting to do for so long. And it's not like I have to be off work to do it. It's just more that it gives me the, f the free space in the mind to get really going and get my teeth into it. So that if and when you know work does pick up again, I can then be in a flow of it, if you know what I mean. Not one stops, one starts. It's just more a case of, got a bit of time in my head to do this you know and have conversations with the likes of yourself and so on i've done more podcast episodes in the last sort of eight, sort of 10 days than i have done since i started it <laughs> that, that just goes to show you like because it, it, it's something i really wanted to do and i didn't get a chance and now that i've got a, a lot of free time i'm mm. just banging the episodes out you know getting four to five a week out at the minute which is a lot good um, it, it's growing nicely so and it's just, I just get to talk to the, the good people, every, like, and such a wide range of people, like yourself. I know we have conversations all the time about health and you, you, you educate me about a lot of things. But then the guy before this was like, a, he, he was on The Apprentice and he was talking about like, you know, go hard, win, win, win. And it was it's like, it's just such a, such a range of people you get to speak to, which, which I love. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to touch on a point there. You were talking about, you know, being grateful in this time. And I think this time is going to humble a hell of a lot of people. I hope so. And, you know, because the, like, especially being a business owner, an entrepreneur, so many people were just flashing on Instagram and social media. And now nobody gives a fuck. <laughs> Everybody's just too worried about themselves. And I know, I know. Like, everybody is talking about gratitude. I'm just, like, we're waking up every day to the best weather we've had in a year. Like, how... <laughs> How how amazing is the lockdown weather? Get up, you can kind of get up at what time you want in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you're in an okay financial situation, it's probably a lot better than the people who are really panicking. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. But even but as long as you're not starving, you know, this is the way I look at it. It kind of brings us back to the primal existence of basic human needs, isn't it? Yeah, this is why this is why I think a lot of people want to be humbled. Mm, I hope so because I think that we were too consumer rich. And to um, material rich, you know, in the sense that we always needed to have something in order to make us feel better. Not me necessarily. I'm not overly, you know, materialistic. I mean, in the sense that, um, you know, I love going to my secondhand clothes shops and, you know, I love making my food from scratch and, 
you know, um, I'm not one to wear a lot of like makeup and I don't do fake tans and I don't do eyelash extensions and I don't do my nails and all these things. I mean, don't forget my nails are all right, but yeah, I just, I just feel like I was never one to be massively over the top with any of that. It's not my thing. Yeah. It's not even that it's over the top. It's just not my thing. But all of that takes a lot of money. You know, yeah. getting your hair done, dyes, you know, all these things cost a lot of money. And um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I don't really bother with that sort of stuff anyway, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm the same. I'm not a big fan of, I want to say I'm not a big fan of branded clothes, but I'm sitting here wearing an Under Armour top right now on camera. No, um, there's certain, I, I wouldn't wear like designer clothes. I don't really spend a lot of money on cars and, and things like that. I, I kind of like to reinvest back in my business or back into myself. Um, and you know, invest in books and courses. Mm -hmm. I just like to know more and become. Yeah. I'm the best investment that I'm ever going to make. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's right. Your knowledge and your experience is critical, so it's just important at the age I'm at and stage I'm at. I think it's important that I just keep working on that. I bought a fancy car before. I had designer clothes before. Do you know what? It actually made me worse because I was just going out every single weekend, mm -hmm. out drinking. Mm -hmm. well, fancy things and I ended up pursuing a lifestyle that I couldn't afford and mm -hmm. I mean, that left me in serious trouble a couple of years ago and I just went you know what this you, you think it's great and it doesn't make you happy just well that's what I was going to say to you regardless of whether or not you couldn't afford it or not afford it many people can afford it but it doesn't actually bring most people the happiness that they think that they're going to be able to fulfill through that that world yeah well you know? it, it made me very over leveraged in my business and it was it, it took yeah. me ages to get out of that that trap right but, you know because you were, you were working just to pay for the bills and pay for the lifestyle and right that, that's not why you want to work you want to work so you can kind of be a bit freer and we're well, after a year probably about a year and a half later we would get out of that situation and now we're in a position where i don't need all that stuff and everything everything's good now and we're, we're, we're growing at a rapid rate because we'll have now the funds to reinvest so it's it just yeah. way, you know you're kind of looking for external validation mm. but it, it comes internally all day long and just even just getting out in nice weather you I know, know going for a run or walking the dog now that like and seeing seeing the family when i get a chance to you know, those are the things that, that that really make you happy i think it is it's, it's literally stripping us back to our our roots our our, our individual um purpose and i know that that doesn't pay the bills um but at least it's some time to reflect on what's important and i'm not saying anything that i'm sure a lot of people haven't said or thought um but that doesn't mean to say that i won't say it again because you know the more we reinforce the importance of those things the more hopefully people will it'll tap home to them okay and what do you how do you think we're going to come out of this What's your opinion on how, how long? It's well, been? in what regard though? In which in which area? Let's say let's say back to full normality. Okay, so if we if, if we come back to full normality, whatever that is, as I'm sure a lot of people say, um, yep. I just hope that our priorities change. Um, I hope that we value the little things that aren't that little. Yeah more uh, i hope that we don't take the things that we didn't have now for granted then and become complacent with them because we've been given them back mm -hmm. you know it's like the song um joni mitchell um don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone <laughs> that's how i feel i feel like um you don't don't know what, what it's like you know things until they're gone you don't you know you don't really appreciate the value of a lot of things because you know it's natural human nature most of the time to be somewhat complacent with our existence you know we become complacent with the things that we have the things that we expect and um, the things that we do and then when all of a sudden those things are taken away from you it, it you know there's there's a value system in re-evaluating that system uh, it's it's going to be very difficult for people to adapt 
you know, the, the, this is going to be a permanent change for a long, or we don't know how permanent it's going to be, but a lot of people are having to look at new things and new areas of, especially if you're a business owner, like, like you and I, you're, you're having to look for new areas to try and generate leads and money and that sort of stuff. And it, it, people are just going to adapt that they're going to fall away. Mm -hmm. But it's adapt and fall away to a certain extent, but at the same time, you know, the, I think there's a lot of value in human contact and, you know, human connection. And I think that, you know, that those things are going to hopefully be more valued because um, we have taken a lot of things for granted for so long. You know, I, I have these fantasies about you know, eating out um, the places that I just took for granted. Right? Yeah. So when I eat there, I know that I just know that when I when I'm engaging with the waiter, I'm just going to be hi, you know, how are you? I'm fine. What are we? You know, it's like you, you know, I've got this like picture in my head of how that's going to be, and I just hope that that continues. I don't mean on that level of ah, but just the appreciation and acknowledgement of people and interactions that people are just like, uh, yeah, can I have such and such place? Uh, you know, well, I would never be like that anyway. I, I'm, yeah. I'm quite, a, I'm quite a social butterfly in the sense that. I talk to anybody, yeah. you know, um, talk the hind leg off a donkey, as I've been told. Maybe even two legs. I, I just think it's strange that, you know, you're walking, you go into the shop now or you're walking down the street or you're going for a run. And people are crossing the road to get away from you. How long is it going to be before that goes back to normal? You know, because you're going to have people who are still skeptical because whenever the lockdown's over, things are going to spike and then they're going to, they're, they're going to fluctuate. Like, it's not going to be like, the lockdown's over, it's just going to go like that. It's oh, no. Going, it's going, so how long is it before you can actually be like that, Ty, before you can actually... That's the point. Grab, grab the waiter's hand and tell him what you love him. <laughs> I know. I can't wait. I don't know how long it's going to be, but I really can't wait. I can't wait for that day, you know, because uh, that's the only thing in all of this. I am a social butterfly, but I'm also really, really good in my own company. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't mind my own head space. I don't mind me. Own, you know, people always say, you know, you can never get away from yourself. You know, well, of course, but it's more just a case of I don't mind uh, solitude. Yeah. I don't mind sanctuary. I don't mind stillness and silence. Those things to me, I find comfort in. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do live with my partner, Jack, and uh, we're managing quite well, like yeah. un under the circumstances of uh, confinement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've, I've spoke to a, a couple of people who are couples in the house um, a guy who was on the podcast last week had said you know the first week was really hard because you're not used to being around each oh, other yeah. the yeah. first week was really difficult but said like after that it was an absolute it was a breeze it's just strange because you don't have to adapt and you know I would be like you I love my own space you know I, I'm a very social person I love going I love speaking to people I'm very extroverted but at the same time, even like the, being with this with the person every single evening with no break, that mm -hmm. I would find that really difficult. Mm -hmm. Although, yeah, but I mean, tonight uh, at six o'clock, I'm on the uh, Zoom to or FaceTime or whatever to my friend Nadine, and then at seven o'clock, I'm on to Sophie, and then at eight o'clock, I'm on to Rosina. So I literally have girly catch up night ahead while he watches whatever movie that he wants to watch that I won't want to watch, like Aliens or something. So you, you know, start your girly afternoon. By the way. What, sorry? Thank you for letting me kickstart your girly after. Oh, yeah, totally. Anytime, anytime. I'm not time for girl, for girl part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you, that, that, that's, well, that's good. I'm sure he's probably glad of the space as well. Yeah, this is the thing. He, he doesn't... He, he, he would say that he doesn't... Um, well, I would say he doesn't need space like I need space. I need space more than he. Mm -hmm. He just... He would you know the way he looks at it is I feed him really well so he, he's very happy <laughs> yesterday I was out in the garden um you know I, well he would cook the odd bit but you know usually I cook so it's just it's lovely like and you know I love I love this time because I look in the cupboards say, say when I'm working right I look in the cupboards and I'm like oh my god <gasps> if only I had the time I would make that 
for example, balsamic pearls. So it's molecular gastronomy. Basically what that means is, is that balsamic reduction, which is obviously balsamic vinegar, reduced down. And then I put it into little pearl drops where it's like in a little um, pipette. Uh -huh. And then I, I place them into, um, I'll put a video up soon of that, um, a little pipette, where it's like, imagine that's olive oil. This is actually jasmine tea. Right. Yeah. Here's one I prepared earlier, yeah. And then you actually, like, you know, you boil up the balsamic and then you, you know, you put it into um, drops. In, and did you ever put olive oil and balsamic vinegar together? They separate. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. they sit separately. <laughs> it's the same as this. They go into little droplets and then you get a little sieve fork and then you put them into water. And they just literally just you know, gather at the bottom and then you scoop them out and that's it. And you've got beautiful little, and it's only an aesthetic thing. It doesn't taste any different, but it's that kind of popping on the tongue of the balsamic pearls. Right. So delicious, right? I would never, ever justify the time to do something like that. Yeah. So this, this is allowing me to do those little things that make me so happy. Yeah. just to make food that I love and Jack's obviously the guinea pig so he's really happy about that and so on but these are my recipe kind of ideas for the cookbook yeah so it's going to be on intolerances gluten-free dairy-free that kind of thing you know for people who have allergies or intolerances or just want to cut them out for a while for whatever reason yeah so all of that so to be honest with you like you know I'm managing quite well in the sense I could cook morning noon and night and come up with loads of different ideas so I'm, I'm i'm happy enough at the moment just getting on with that yeah fair play i mean that, it's something i really enjoy is cooking when mm -hmm. i get a chance to do it but it, for me it seems so pointless to just sit and cook for myself I, I don't get any satisfaction out of it i would rather have somebody over here and cook for them um because you know you sit down and have a meal by yourself you just cooked up you just clean you know it's probably about two hours out of your day I loved it. I mean, I lived on my own. I cooked. That's when I learned the most. That's when I did my nutrition qualifications. You know, everyone's different. You know, my mom says she eats to survive. And yes, if she enjoys it in the process, that's great. But she's not, not like me in any which way. She doesn't know where I came from, you know, with my absolute utter passion for cooking. You, you do a lot. You always tell me about your vegan meals. Like you do a lot of, of mm -hmm. vegan stuff, but even though you're not a vegan, but you, you, you just love the, the good food and the, and the recipes that go alongside it so is there anything that you can tell people you know educate people on that might sort of flip them towards that and start eating more plant-based mm -hmm. well i'll tell you when i was when i was when my mom was pregnant with me she felt sick um when she went into the butcher shop um she you know pregnancy sickness not even morning sickness she had it Anytime meat was about, she couldn't handle it, touch it, cook it, smell it, eat it, nothing. So then when I was born, apparently I spat it out like a like a pet of an olive uh, meat. So I've never had meat in my life. And then mum said, you know, trust you to be making statements before you're even born, you know, telling me from the womb that you weren't having a bit of it. And I said, well, I have to start somewhere, you know, I'll have a laugh about it and so on. But basically, um, I think that's helped me be not so um, activist orientated with veganism and, you know, in, in sort of like radical fundamental principles yeah, of you're existence. Just, you're promoting the health benefits of it. And yeah. Food, just that, you know, yeah, I get what you mean. And it's just, it's, it's looking at what it is rather than what it's become. Yeah. You know, looking at what veganism actually re represents rather than what it's stigma to yeah. represent the stigma around it you know so stigmatized uh because of animal rights and so on i'm not undermining um, animal rights if people want to have the belief to do that because that's that's fair, fair enough as long as you're not hurting anybody in the process yeah. um but veganism is plant-based food yeah and yeah. that's what nature gave us and that's been here forever and it's not rocket science, like with regards to understanding that plant-based food is food that's plant-based that's grown on the earth. Yeah. That's it. 
but this is why whenever we speak about this, this is why I listen to you because you're not taking that aggressive approach mm-hmm. and you're not, you're doing it because you like the food. You're doing it because it's good for you. You don't take that. I, like there's so many people who have just jumped on a bandwagon and have mm-hmm. just, who you, it, it's the, you know, they're trying to meet their human need for significance. They want to feel important and they do that by calling themselves a vegan. Mm-hmm. And I remember going to a restaurant called, on the Lisburn Road, which not surprisingly, I have to hear the story, is closed down. It was yeah. called The Honest Vegan. And yeah. I walked in and the owner was there and I was like, all right, okay. It's like, uh, do you consider yourself an honest vegan? And he looked at me and he kind of, there was a bit of hesitancy and I, I, I said, well, do you? And he says, well, most of the time. So I was like, what do you mean by most of the time? And he, he, he didn't really have an answer. So I was like, so you, you're not really a vegan then. You're just somebody who's just jumped on a trend and you just kind of do it when you feel like it. And that's what I think a lot of people are doing. They are. And that's why I'm, first of all, I'm very glad that I've been a vegetarian, but I'm not even, I, see, it's like, I don't even want a term for myself. I've been the way I've been from birth that I, I don't eat meat. Right? Um, I don't want a medal for it. I don't want, you know, I remember being at school and, you know, if I didn't have time to have a, a lunch in school, I'd grab a pot noodle. Like, literally, going to be honest about that, although it, I'm 39 now and that was when I was 12, so it's okay. But basically, I, uh, I can remember having it and people would say, oh, she's having meat. Oh my God, she's having meat. She's having meat. You know, like, I says, if you just, it, it says soya. <laughs> Uh, chicken, right. chicken and mushroom pot has no chicken. I know, but it's just, I it's still, the a, I felt the same. <laughs> I mean, it is pure trash, like, but yeah. I can remember people, there is if they want to catch you out or something. And it's, it's just really funny because I don't really care. Like that stuff doesn't bother me. I know what I am. I know what's true to me. I, yeah. If you don't want to believe me or you don't, whatever, it doesn't really bother me. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the first thing second of all uh, i'm just so grateful that i've luckily been born um not eating meat because i haven't had to take out the bacon sandwich if you understand what i mean like um because i one night got really drunk and had a bacon sandwich and it all went back to normal you know this is what happens a lot of people who are yeah, you know yeah. try that that road and then they're like, oh one night, one night and had a donor kebab you know that's the end of that um, luckily, I, I, I've never experienced that. Luckily, yeah, I've never had it. Life. You know, people say, oh, you don't know what you're missing. You don't know what you're missing. And I say, well, I've never had heroin either. And I, I don't really care if I'm missing it, if you know what I mean. It's like, uh, I don't know what I'm missing there either. But that doesn't mean to say I'm going to try heroin. It doesn't mean I'm going to try beef. You know, it's the same thing for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just whatever, you know, there's enough going on in the world. And that's why I'm not like out preaching at people and telling them what they should or shouldn't be doing because the way I look at it is, is that it's up to the individual to make their own decisions and their own mind up as to what they feel they want to do it's not up to me to ram it down their throat literally yeah no pun intended however if people are wanting to move as you asked me you know towards the plant-based notion you know it's just to make sure that you get your not just protein because people talk about it must you have to get protein 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 and where you're getting your protein. So they think that they have to get it from soya, miso, tempeh, corn, um, that they have to replace the meat with a meat-like substitute that's going to give them the equivocal yeah. uh, amount of protein that they would get in their chicken or whatever. And it's really nonsense. It's nonsense. Um, my, my doctor did a blood test on me a good few years ago, checked my protein levels and my d3 levels and usually you'd have to um, and b12 levels in order to make sure that you were um, not deficient um, and malnourished due to your vegetarianism or whatever and my d3 b12 and protein she said and iron were a lot higher than the most carnivore ridden person you've ever met yeah so this myth. How, how would you? How yeah? How would you get? How would you get that in your system? What are the foods you were eating that maybe other people don't eat? Uh, avocados every day. Oh, I love avocados. So avocado is is a protein. It's a, a amino acid. It's a complex carbohydrate. It's an essential fat. 
It's, a, it's actually essentially a complete food. It's just a big spoonful of deliciousness. That's all, that's all I see it as. I love it. I really do. And there's not, like, it really makes me sad when I wake up in the morning and I go to put my knife in the avocado and it's already went bad. I know, I know, I hate that too. I mean, the way I look at it is... Your um, last one. <laughs> and I, I've been eating them forever. And then, you know, as you know, the last couple of years have become really, really, really popular. And I often find when I really love something that I've loved for a long time that then becomes really popular, you start to worry and panic that there's going to be a... People are going to run out of avocados and what are we going to do, you know? It's like, oh, no, we can't run out of avocados. Um, and, you know, it's th- like getting things like brown basmati rice. Brown basmati rice right. is full of fiber. It's full of B vitamins. It's full of complex carbohydrate, which means that it's sustainable blood sugar release for energy. Um, whereas white rice is rendered useless nutritionally it doesn't have any um, uh, complex carbohydrate. It's been turned into a simple carbohydrate, which essentially just completely sugars. Right. So your carbohydrate of which sugars is nearly its entirety. So from the glucose to glycogen conversion is really high. Whereas if you have brown rice, you've got a slower release. It's also got protein. Yeah. People don't think that rice is having protein. It depends on the type of rice. It depends how it's cooked. White rice doesn't have protein the way that brown rice has. So it's about knowing where proteins and where hidden carbohydrates that are good for you are that people automatically don't lend themselves to, if you understand. People think carbs, think pasta bread. That's it. You know, pasta bread. They don't yeah. think, you know, when they say bad pasta or bad carbs, they think pasta bread. Would you think to yourself, well, there's white rice, there's couscous. They're all essentially very... They're not amazing. Potato. A, a, a potato. Um, a potato quinoa. is what's sorry? And quinoa as well. Quinoa is amazing because it's a protein and quinoa. it's a complex carbohydrate. Yeah. So even though it's not a protein in the sense of um, its makeup structure, it still provides a lot of protein in the diet. Yeah. Uh, potatoes, um, you know, they're starchy. People think a baked potato is really good for you. Um, it's actually way worse than a boiled potato. Really. Yes, because okay. it's so glycemically high. It's the highest of most cornflakes, white rice, and baked potatoes. They're, they're when I say GI heavy, what I mean by that is, is that their glycemic index conversion from glucose to glycogen is really high. So you, you have a spike and a, and a peak okay. and a trough in your insulin uh, production from your pancreas, which isn't good for sustainability of energy and blood sugar production. So it sort of skews your glycemic index. Whereas if you were to have skin on, um, boiled baby boils, really, really steady. That's why baked potatoes taste so good. It's because they've caramelized in the oven because of the temperature that it's been brought to to cook it. And that's why it's so gorgeous, that thick, crusty, you know, I mean, I think I might have a baked potato today now because this is oh, the I've idea. Been sit, I've been sitting here beside a bowl of muesli, which is still full from the start of our conversation. <laughs> I'm really, really hungry. Um, no, I, I, I completely agree. I think baked potatoes are delicious. I love it when they're nice and crispy and mm. it's just you're breaking them open and you, you're almost like, like snapping. Well, it's, it's so good. You're really I know. Good. Oh, um, I know. So I, I remember the first time that I was introduced to quinoa and I didn't know what it was. And I, I remember, because at the time, I, th- I think it was, it must have been in my early, late teens, early 20s. And I remember reading something, I think it was the, uh, the Thor workout. This is what everybody done back then. Everybody went on and wanted to see what the Thor workout was and then go and try it, try and get bigger in the gym. Mm-hmm. I remember they were saying like the, to get Chris Hemsworth bigger, that he needed more protein, so they started pumping quinoa into him along with his chicken and whatever. And I was like, all right, I feel like that. If I wanna, if I wanna increase my size, and I need to, I need to eat this quinoa stuff. And I remember getting it and making it and looking at it and just going, "Fuck me, I'm gonna have to throw that in the bin. <laughs> it's disgusting." <laughs> but I actually, it, was, it wasn't until a few weeks later. I remember I went somewhere and I seen they had like a quinoa dish, and I was like, "I'll give it another go," and then mixed it up with some spices and. Um, a few other things and it was really delicious and ever since I know I- this is the point this is the point it, it's not the food it's how it's cooked and what it's used with 
and you see if you add things in like toasted pine nuts and feta and mint and roasted sweet potato and a nice yogurt turmeric dressing or some seeds you yeah. know something like that um you know balsamic vinegar over the top or whatever because i remember the first time when you when you spoke there it just brought me right back to my first quinoa experience and i thought i don't trust this and i can't even pronounce it either anything i can't pronounce i'm looking i just don't think it's right for me <laughs> i don't think anybody has a first pleasurable quinoa experience when they yeah, or like, what can happen is you can have quinoa virginity it's not it's not a good experience for them <laughs> well it's when it's like it, 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 it gets better with time <laughs> keep that to yourself then. um but it's just i think it's more just a case of for me is um i i I often would have something out and about for the first time and then you try and replicate that at home and sometimes that's when things can either go wrong or go better you think oh my god i'll never eat that out again because um you know i can do it so much better at home or you know what really annoys me about you know being a vegetarian um whatever title um when you go out and there's nothing on the menu and the one thing and if, if any vegetarians and vegans out there well obviously there's hundreds it's becoming more and more and more popular yeah. um and fair play to everyone who's doing that um you'll all identify and feel the pain of i'll do you a stir fry i'll do you a stir fry the chef he says he can do you a stir fry if i hear that one more time he can do you a stir fry i just think have I literally come out for someone to do me a stir fry? I mean, is eating out not meant to be an experience? You know, is eating out not meant to be something that you is out of your norm? Is that not the whole point? Am I missing the point? And for them to say, I'll do you a stir fry is, is insulting to your intelligence. Yeah. Well, most restaurants now have a good vegetarian oh, okay. selection now, but I remember I exactly what you're saying. A load of years back, there was one veg. When I walked in the Hilton, there was one vegetarian option, and you know it was <laughs> exactly what you said. There, the chef could throw you together a stir fry. But this, even the fact that you've used the term "one vegetarian option," when when they say to me, "Your vegetarian option is," I say, "Well, an option means you've choice." Yeah. How can I have an option in one thing? One thing yeah. means I don't have an option. So you're giving me no option but to have one thing, but you're calling it a vegetarian option. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, it's a ghost cheese tart that's taken out of the freezer. <laughs> I know that. Only, I know. Ghost, ghost cheese. And I, I hate to shoot the messenger because essentially the waiter is the messenger who's bringing you the ghost cheese tart that, that you're talking about. But you just want to go into the, you want to just say, tell you what you do. Can you just take me in to the back, into the kitchen, and we'll just work this out. And, I, you know, I'll, I'll do it for free. I'll give you my advice. <laughs> it doesn't mean that I know it all, but I'm telling you, if all you're going to do is give me the one option, which isn't an option, I could help you. So if anyone out there is a chef and they're confused or they want more guidance or they want a better variety of food on their, on their, on their menu, give me a shout. You heard it there first, folks. There's a new business venture styles get into. <laughs> um, finally, so we, we're... We always ask this question at the end of the podcast. So there's only 15% of people that stay and listen to the end of a podcast. So what do you have to say to those 15, 15% of people, not 15 people, 15% of people who started? Oh, well, that's a hard one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, it depends. Are you asking me for guidance, advice, knowledge, insight? This is just, just, you, just generally your own opinion. Most people just say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for like a, a, a hard question. philosophical debate. Um, it is a hard question. Um, I would probably say that um, people are probably listening to more and more podcasts now because A, they have more time. B, people are moving away from this notion of quick sound bite snippet bits of information to gain a lot of information within a two minute sound bite. And the way I look at it is, is that the, the fact that we're doing what we're doing shows that um, those 15% who do listen to the end value communication. Yeah. And they value interaction and they value listening to something in its entirety. And I would hope to say that in five years from now, that that percentage will increase 
due to the the content in which they're listening to so it's about putting out information that's worthwhile and um, the people can connect to it's all about connection that's what it's about connection and if people can make a connection it doesn't have to be something that's like you know so revolutionary that you know people are wowed by it it's just more about connecting to people on an individual and on a mass scale level brilliant thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate it. it was an excellent podcast today there's a lot of great information there and i can't wait to share it so thank you very much that was well chris thanks okay.